It's been, it's been a huge blessing being able to help oversee our Cityside site out in Honolulu. Uh, we've been meeting there weekly since last August. So come this August, we're going to hit one year. And it's been phenomenal just seeing the different lives and families touched because of us going out there. Uh, there's this one story of this couple, uh, longtime members here at Pearlside. And uh, they've been, uh, the, the wife has been praying for her brother and his family for over 10 years. Over 10 years, believing for the family to come and receive Christ and be touched by the gospel. And uh, after coming out to Cityside, I think it was only like a couple months into our weekly services, they started to come. And then a week after that, they got saved. And the, the day they got saved, the, the, the father, the wife, and the child, they were huddled together just crying in tears because of being touched by the presence of God. And, but yet, that wasn't just us going out there you know, and making it happen, but it was predicated on 10 years of prayer of, of this sister believing for her brother and, and her in-laws and, and, and their, their family, and it's such a powerful moment. And so th thank you, uh, main campus here, for believing and, and sending us out there. It's been great, and we are continuing to believe for new sites and new campuses to continue to come forth from this center here. We call this our training and sending center. You know, I know sometimes we forget we come here and it's so comfortable, you know, coming on a Saturday evening or Sunday morning to this main campus. But really, you know, these kind of testimonies are great because it reminds us of really the purpose and the reason why God has called us together to be a church. And I share all that because even within our own households and our own families, sometimes it could just, we can just confine ourselves to our own goals and dreams of hoping to retire well, that our kids go off to a good college, you know, that, you know, our, me and my spouse, we can continue to live healthy lives and that we'll see our grandchildren, you know, one day and they'll be uh, great and walking with God. And, and sometimes we just relegate ourselves to this, just this kind of uh, a smaller thinking than what God has for us. And so last week, Pastor Norman, if you're here, brought a powerful and excellent word explaining how marriage is really for a mission. And so today we're going to be talking about modern family and uh, the idea behind that is just breaking down, you know, what society says a modern family looks like and how it's kind of just thrown roles and responsibilities kind of out the window. And it's caused some chaos in our society. And so we're going to go back to looking at what does the word say and how does the word proclaim, well, how has God designed families to be? Now, um, before I go any further, since some of you may be hearing me for the first time and you know, like I said, I'm always out there in Honolulu now. You, you don't see me much here at the main campus as much. Um, I just want to show you a picture of my modern family. And there you see my wife and uh, my beautiful four kids right there. Stella is closest to you. Um, she is eight years old. Kenzo next to her obviously is the only boy in our family. Uh, he's quite a testimony. He stopped breathing when he was born. And he was in the NICU for over a month. And we weren't sure if he was going to live or die. And praise God, to this day, he is healthy, strong, doing really well, despite being the only son in the house. Um, he manages. I, I try to help him out and back him up. And then Zara, so he's five. Zara is uh, six years old. Uh, she loves to draw the artist of the family and uh, loves to pray. Um, about a month ago, I took them swimming, and I cut my toe open on a sprinkler. I just was carrying my one-year-old over there, and I kicked the sprinkler, and my toe, like, it was a just deep gash, and it started to bleed. And so in that moment, as, you know, I was just in pain, and I'm like, I need to get, to, uh, I need to take care of this blood, right? So I sit down in the van. The last thing I thought of on my mind was to pray, and here comes Zara, my six-year-old, so sweet. She, she lays her hand on my cut. So I'm like, Zara, what are you doing? And then she starts, dear Lord Jesus. And she begins to pray for healing over my foot. I love, I love, I love just the, her faith and how God's really growing in her heart. And then, of course, don't let that cute face fool you. I'm not talking about my wife. I'm talking about my daughter, um, Sanaya. She's one and a half. She's the cutest thing in the world. But, man, is she vicious. She's something else. Like, God tricked me and my wife. We, Stella here, closest to us, the eight-year-old, she's an angel. The day she was born, she, she slept pretty quickly. Like, I think, like, barely a month in, she would sleep throughout the night. She's so easy. You know, yes, daddy. Yes, mommy. 
It's so sweet. Um, I shared this before. You didn't hear it. Parents, you might be jealous. You might hate me, but hey, you know, God blessed me with her. Uh, Stella, she, she wakes up before my wife and I every morning to wake up the rest of her siblings that go to school. She gets them dressed, brings them downstairs. She helps, you know, pour their bowls of cereal and packs their lunch. She makes sandwiches for them. And I just roll out of bed, wash my face, brush my teeth, put on my clothes, and take them to school. Because she did all the work for us. So, so Naya here, she's the opposite. Okay, she's one. And we had her first. We, you might not see the size of the family, you know, that we have today if Sanaya came first. So thank God. God knew what he was doing. And uh, that's Blanca. Um, I've been married to her for uh, over 10 years. We actually just hit 11 years this past February. And it's been... We've been through some wars, and, and that's why as I, I'm going to, you know, as much as I love my wife, um, just tonight as we get further in the topic and we talk about modern family and we're going to look at different scriptures, you know, I'm not just preaching to you as a, a pastor or someone that has studied, you know, the, the words of God, but I'm really coming with you from the heart of a husband and a father that has been walking in life you know, in this situation uh, or in this context for a number of years now. Not that I'm an expert, but throughout it all, I've seen God's grace work in my life, in my marriage, keeping us together at times when during the biggest and nastiest fights, and even between my children and I, times where I'm like, why, God, did you give me four kids? And uh, still, you know, being able to keep my sanity. So that's where I'm coming from tonight. Um, but one more thing on Sanaya. This just happened this past week. Uh, just to show you, I have evidence of how terrible she can be sometimes. So she, pray for her. She really needs Jesus. Pastor Camille, please put her on the top of the intercessors list for her to get saved. And uh, so we, like, we love to go to the beach, you know, beach and spam musubis going hand in hand. So notice in this picture, something's awry. If you look at the top, there's my son. This was not a staged photo. He is really in despair He's, he's just hating life in that moment. And you can't really see Sanaya, but if we take, go to the next shot, it's because she stole his family to be. Look at that face. <laughs> Look at Kenzo. Poor guy. Oh, my gosh. And so, you know, in, in family, there needs to be order. And as a loving father, for me to have witnessed this, even though my daughter is cute and I could rationalize it, well, you know, she's younger than you, son. You're stronger than her. You let her take your spam to be good for you. You need to learn, you know, to, to fight and defend and, and, and make sure you own that spam to be. That's your spam to be, Kenzo. No, as a loving father, I came in, and even though whatever limited, you know, capacity that Sanaya has to understand English, I told her that was wrong. That's not your spam be. You've already had a spam be, and this is your brother's only spam be, which you stole. So I removed it from her hands as calm as possible. I'm not going to reenact what it looked like because probably there's like shards of rice flying everywhere. You know, as this, and I was like freaking out, and I gave it to Kenzo. And uh, that's, you know, that's my responsibility as a father is to love my wife and to raise my children. And so when we look at scripture, there's a lot to say about this. And in Genesis chapter 2, we're going to start off with this passage tonight. And I believe Pastor Norman uh, mentioned it last week as well. So we're going to revisit it and point out some interesting points here that was not covered last week. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you, sh you will surely die. So just taking a quick pause here. This is before Eve came along. Adam was created first. And these instructions for Adam to work to keep the garden was very apparent. It's clear to him. There's no confusion that this was his primary role and responsibility that was given to him from God. Verse 18, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. 
So here already, you know, comes about Eve. Uh, God designs Eve, uh, creates Eve from Adam's rib. And this word helper, uh, just to be clear, you know, already some women sitting there like, what do you mean? We're just helpers? What is this? You know, it's, it's not a subservient type of helper where you're, you're a second class. You're not as good as man. You're second to your husband. That's not what we're talking about here. The word helper is actually uh, God uses that same language in Proverbs when he calls us his helper. It's a companionship, a partnership. So that's what that is. But in the design of how God created things, it's first he created Adam and then he created Eve. See, God created things with structure because he's not a God of chaos. God is a God of order. And thank God for that, right? That God designed things in his infinite wisdom, things that we can even barely comprehend in our finite minds. He's created things, like things that we don't talk about. Like, thank God that, you know, the, the, the parts that we cover up down here are down there, right? Would it, how awkward would it be if it was, like, on our heads, those parts, Right? Don't think about it too hard, but, but just think about the functions, right? How there's excrements that come out of there. <laughs> you know, if you think your neighbor has bad breath now, if God was not a God of order and he was not a God of perfect design, we'd, we'd have a really tough time. Um, I, all I know is buy stock in Tic Tacs and, uh, you know, Listerine. It'd probably go skyrocket if that was the case. But... But thank God, God is a God of order. I mean, even, you know, we talk about physics, right? And there's natural laws that rule and govern the universe and this earth and this planet. Um, I'm, you know, never really did really great in that subject, Chinese, so it's more like math, not so much science. But um, in, in physics, obviously, the way the world spins and the gravity that we have on this earth is just perfect for us. Because if it spun any faster, we would not be able to have life on this planet, this earth. And if gravity was any more, we'd be crushed. If it was any less, we wouldn't be here on sitting down comfortably on our chairs. And so there's laws of physics. And when we try to push these uh, laws in place and we push past these boundaries, we can end up hurt. For example, you know, on on-ramps, right? When I was younger, I have a friend from high school that's in the audience today that knows that I used to love to drive really fast, and I'll just leave it at that, um, past the speed limit back in high school. And I did get into a wreck before that totaled my car and it affected my relationship with my father. So here I hurt a friend in the car. He was riding with me, totaled the car, so I um, hurt the property that the car crashed into as well as financially sustained the loss. But then it also caused the rift between my father and I for many years. Because I chose to disobey that law, I went around the corner way too fast, and I got hurt. Well, in the same sense, God has ordained relational laws. He has placed order and structure in our families and in our households in the way it should operate and run. And some of us, we walk around thinking, ah, we don't need the Bible. It's archaic. I mean, you got shows like Modern Family, you know, showing all these different examples of how homes can be. And we try to see what that is and hear, you know, what the next great guru says on parenting and, and on loving your spouse. And we look at all these things, but we fail to look at what the original intent and design of family was meant to be. And we go away from God's design and God's structure. And no wonder we're flying around the bend too fast, getting our relationships in a mess and getting it entangled in things that it was never meant to be entangled in because we chose to go away from God's design. And so here it's apparent that God designed man first and then he designed woman. But as we fast forward now to the next chapter in chapter 3, Genesis says that now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. This is in reference to Satan coming in. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now, what's interesting here is that he doesn't go to the man. Satan goes to the woman who were, was not originally given those instructions to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. 
But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So um, this is a little caveat, doesn't really relate to this message, but I think this is important. For those of us who ever wondered, why is it so bad that she ate from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Like, why wouldn't God want us to have this, right? Is he trying to keep us oppressed and keep us ignorant? Like, I don't know what's wrong and what's right. No, the, the, the fact is that Adam and Eve had this perfect relationship between each other they walked around naked. They had nothing they had to hide between each other. The relationship was, was perfect. Why? Because they had a perfect relationship with God. See, up until that point, they walked in the garden with God in their midst. And so here, when, when, they, when they decided, Adam and Eve decided to partake from this tree, it's saying, as even the, the serpent actually said it to them, he said, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. So when, when we dictate for ourselves what is right and what is wrong, we are saying, God, we don't need you. I don't need to submit to you. I don't need to trust you or have faith in your word because I know what is right and I know what is wrong. So ever, if you ever go back to that on your own time and you're reading it, it's like, what's wrong with that? There's a lot wrong with that because bottom line is God wants us to have a relationship with him. And this act of partaking from the tree was pure rebellion, saying, I don't need you to tell me what to do, God. You are no longer my God. I am my own God. And so that's what Eve did. We wonder, where was Adam in this, right? And Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 to 7 shows us. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and also gave some to her husband who was with her. Oh man, you don't need reality TV when you have the Bible. You know, like this is some drama going on. What was Adam doing? Can you imagine? Like the serpent is like, like right there deceiving Eve, Adam was the one that was given the responsibility, is the head of the household, should make these decisions. And he's there, I don't know, maybe watching NBA, you know, finals. Now there's going to be a, a game five, right? The, what, Eve? Snake in the garden? Oh, I'll handle it later. <laughs> yeah. Right, what was Adam doing? Seriously. What was he doing? Right, he was not doing his role as the husband, as the head of the home. He should have made that decision. And we're going to break that down a little bit more. So he was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So ever since that incident, because now that they don't have this perfect relationship with God, it was severed. Now shame and sin entered the world. And to this day, we deal with that. And that's why we have divorce. That's why we have broken homes. That's why we have people lying and cheating because it's, it's different forms of fig leaves that they try to cover up in their relationships with each other to try to defend and protect themselves. But thank God that families thrive when we fulfill our God-ordained roles. So what are our, our God-ordained roles? I'm glad you asked because it's found right here in Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, we're going to look at verse 22 to 28. And Joey, if you can have verse 33 ready to go in a little bit too. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Upon reading this scripture, uh, I, some of you wives right now, I know, are probably fidgeting in your seat. And uh, I'm going to command the ushers to lock the doors because some of you are like, man, what is this? I didn't come to hear this. <laughs> Wives, submit to your husbands in everything. I mean, that is a tall order. And um, for some of you wives, very much so because you look at your husband, maybe you can think of him like Adam where he didn't lead, right? He's not leading in my home. I'm the one like, Pastor Tim, you don't understand. Like, submit to him everything. The reason why I'm seated here tonight in church is because I had to drag my lazy husband out, outside of his couch watching golf all day. 
you know, into service tonight. Honey, we got to go to church. You know, tomorrow we have a graduation party in the morning. And so we have all these services at Grace Bible Church Pearlside. There's no excuse to miss service. So come on, honey, get dressed now. Get your bibbity wearing butt off the couch. Let's go, right? So how I have to submit to him and everything? Pastor Tim, I wouldn't even be here. Well, thank God you're here because I'm going to get to the men next. So you don't have to worry about that, okay? But, but we are so su- We, I'm not a woman, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not confused, okay? There's evidence. I'm married, I have four kids. It's all there. <laughs> I love my wife. And it's very evident. If it wasn't for the surgery, I love my wife so much, we'd have more kids. Okay, enough said with that. <laughs> for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. And so, see... The, hus- the husband is the head of the wife. And so if, if wives are having a hard time sitting, submitting to husbands, don't just nudge your wife like, see, you nag me so much. You don't ever submit to anything I say. Well, my question to you men is, are you leading? Are you doing what God has called you to do? Or are you just a reincarnation of Adam and just following in his footsteps? That while your wife is defending the garden and the snake, which you were supposed to do, you're just out there doing nothing. And so, unfortunately, we end up with this two spectrums that we have today for men that we can tend to either be too passive, you know, we're emasculated, and we don't make any decisions, we don't lead, um, maybe we're even apathetic, and we just, ah, oh, whatever, I don't care. And this is the way we live. And, and then the other spectrum is this over chauvinist masculinity that's a caricature of what true masculinity or biblical masculinity looks like. It's this, this rejection of this idea of, of what that person looks like, that, that passive Adam. And so nowadays we got these guys like, oh, how loud I can burp, right? How many push-ups I can do. Where your strength, yeah, that, that's nice. Let's be healthy. Let's be strong. But that in itself, the physical strength does not make you a man. Nor, um, here's another type of this, is that everything is a competition to you. So your success at work is not just because, you know, you want to glorify God in your business. Because please, let's all work hard, men. Let's work hard at our jobs. But your, your success is not driven by because I have a God that's worth glorifying in every aspect of my life. And so I'm going to work hard at my job because of that. No, you're driven because you admire the power and the respect that you get. You're, 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 you hunger after that, after that. And your wife is not even someone you love, but it's more like a trophy that you showcase around. And so here you have this end of the spectrum. But what is God calling us to be, men? Right here down the middle, we're not passive, we're not overly chauvinistic, but we follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to see this in Ephesians 5 now as we continue to read. Now, as the church submits to Christ, also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Verse 25, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So here Jesus demonstrates what Adam should have done. Adam should have have been (laughs) passive with the snake. Neither should he have been prancing around, oh, snake, where? Let me get the snake, you know. And it's, but, but it's this responsibility. Adam should have risen up as the man, as the one who received the original orders from God to protect the garden. He did not. But Jesus, not only does he show us what true masculinity is by taking responsibility for himself, he then takes responsibility for us, the church. See, Jesus knew no sin but became sin for us. That's mind-blowing now. Not only is he keeping himself in check, but here is this man that loves his bride so much, we're talking about Jesus, and it's a metaphor, him and the church, that he's willing to die for the church. Now this is huge for us husbands to understand because there's times where we feel like our wives are unlovable because our wives have been disrespectful, right? Right? Because of the beginning of Ephesians 5, we look at our wives and we're like, oh, because she does not respect me and obey me in everything, I'm not going to then love her. And we see in verse 33 of Ephesians 5, however, each one of you must love his wife 
as he loves himself. It's easy to, our, to love ourselves, husbands, men. Easy to love ourselves. But that same kind of love that we love ourselves, we're supposed to love our wives. And the wife must respect her husband. Man. So how do wives disrespect their husbands? Okay, Holy Spirit, come right now. Protect me. <laughs> ushers, I need, I need ushers here in case anyone tries to rest the stage with some pitchforks. Pastor Kathy will protect me. <laughs> How do wives disrespect their husbands? Well, every, everything that your husband says, you try to correct them. You try to bring correction constantly to your husband. You constantly nag your husband. Your husband says something, you roll your eyes at your husband. Even if your husband does not see you rolling your eyes at him, you're still disrespecting him. And then, you know, we have these times where we get together, we... I'm not a woman. I'm sorry. I did it twice tonight. <laughs> I'm not confused. I promise. <laughs> There's times where women get together, and then instead of being a time of edifying, it d just becomes a time of gossiping and talking bad about their husbands. And so that's how women disrespect their husbands. Husbands, we're called to love our wives as Christ loved the church. So how do we, how are we unloving to our wives? Well, because our wives hold disrespect from us, husbands, and we feel like we don't want to love our wife. We no longer compliment her or pursue her like the way we once did before we were married, right? It's almost like your wife becomes like a roommate to you that you just kind of tolerate because there's no love anymore in the relationship. When I was in college, I had a lot of roommates um, going through college, male roommates, and it's almost like we treat our wife now almost like one of our roommates because we're not getting the respect that, that we feel like we're deserving of. And so what, what needs to come first? Does the husband need to love his wife first or does the wife need to respect her husband first? What's going to break this spiral? Because the less the, the wife respects the husband, the, 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 the less the husband loves the wife. And then that causes the wife to despise and respect her husband even less. And then the, you see how the marriages just keep spiraling downwards and downwards. And it ends up into this place where they feel like, oh, irreconcilable differences. We can't make it happen. We can't make it work anymore. I'm no longer happy in this relationship. So who's at fault? Who needs to go first? Does the wife go first or the, the, does the husband go first? The answer is yes. Wait, what? I asked you who goes first. Husband or wife? Husband love wife first or wife lo uh, respect husband first? Answer again is yes. If you in here are a believer, you have faith in God, and God is your authority, you're not loving, husbands, we're not loving our wives just because, you know, it's for our own benefit. We're doing it because God told us to. And it's the way we can honor God in our households, in our marriage. Regardless of how our wives treat us. And the same with, with you wives in here today. Women in here. The, the, the men that God has placed in your life, even if they're not worthy of respect at that moment, because of who God has placed them in and because of who God is, when you respect your husband, despite what they do and say and what they don't do, you're actually respecting God. And husbands, when you love your wives, you're actually loving, demonstrating your love for God. See, we can't be so nearsighted um, where we just lose track of what the bigger picture is. Our marriages are meant for so much bigger than just us, our own personal happiness. But really, it's a demonstration to the world of what it looks like God's love for us, the church. And so, husbands, the better we lay down our lives, that even, you know, when we don't feel like saying sorry, and we apologize to our wives, and it almost feels like you're being crucified, like, that's how painful, <sighs> sorry, like, it's just painful to get out that sorry. Hey, I'm there. I've been, I've been through some major fights with my wife, and it's like, no, she needs to apologize first, God. She's more wrong than me. I'm like, this much wrong? She's this much wrong. How can I, why would I apologize first? Well, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for me. That even while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. Before I came to say, Jesus, I need you in my life. 
He already died for me. And if I'm called to model that kind of relationship as Jesus modeled be, uh, between him and the church as I need to model with my wife, then I need to go and lay down my life, even when I don't feel like it, you know, to, to demonstrate my love for her. And so if that's bringing reconciliation in our marriage through a disagreement, through a fight, or if that means doing something that will bless her but is an inconvenience to me, I'm going to do it because I love my wife, but more importantly because I love my God. So, you know, we, we see in this day and age, um, the TV shows, we talked about Modern Family. Um, that's a show where basically you see these different households, and it's, it's a smorgasbord. Like, it's just craziness of all these different families and the, the systems that you see. And then in that, in that show, though, one of the primary characters is Ed O'Neill, actor. Do you remember what show he was on prior to Modern Family years ago? Married with children, love and marriage. Remember that show? For those of us, no, I'm the only one that watched it. I'm the only sinner, heathen. Okay, that's okay. That's okay. Jesus, pray, come and fill me with your grace. But yeah, married with children, we see Ed O'Neill. Um, his name was Al Bundy, this is the character he played. And in Al Bundy, it's kind of that picture of Adam uh, being passive in the garden, that all he does is come home, remember, sticks his hand in his pants. Like, really deep down, it's pretty gross. And he just watches TV. He doesn't care what his children do. They kind of are like, like delinquents, both of them, the, the daughter and the son, because it's a lack of parenting. And then the wife is constantly disrespecting him and, you know, running her mouth. And it's just madness in that house. And uh, all he does is relish in the past. He, he do like the Heisman pose. Right, And he always talked about how back at Polk High School, he scored five touchdowns in a single game. Right, And then so he's just so fixated on his past victories. He's failing to look at the, the destiny and the purpose that he has for his life. And because he doesn't have that, he doesn't even bring that into his household. And so you look at his children. And his children are, have gone awry. And so it's not just, you know, when we talk about modern family and what the Bible designed families to be, we looked at how wives are called to respect husbands and husbands are called to love wives. Well, parents need to parent and children need to submit. In Genesis chapter 4, we're not going to turn there tonight, but I'm going to summarize it. Um, the first two offspring of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, and unfortunately, things go really um, bad in the garden well, they were outside the garden, but in, in the, from the beginning here, this first family, um, Cain and Abel, where Cain murders Abel. And here, the Bible is not really detailed in all the, the factors, the lack of parenting, and the things that may have led up to that. But if Adam continued the trend of what happened originally when Eve partook and listened to the serpent, then you could safely assume that he probably continued that lack of leadership in the home. And that led to his, uh, one of his children's demise. In fact, Cain's life wasn't that much better after that, after he killed his brother. Well, in Ephesians um, chapter 6, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. So I know not everyone here is married, so this is, you know, for, you, for those of you who are single in here, this is for you to really grasp. Honor your, your father and your mother. And, um, you know, even if you, for all of us, that's Pastor Key honors Pastor Camille as his mother. This is not something that we ever grow out of, no matter how old we get, no matter how much more we know in knowledge than our parents. We never grow out of this aspect of honoring our parents, our father and mother. Why is that? Again, because when we choose to honor our parents, who God has predestined for us to be born with, we don't get to choose our families, right? We were born into our families. Even if you're adopted, God somehow orchestrated things for you to, to be able to receive the adopted parents that you have. So you don't get to really choose that. And, and so this is... When we honor our parents, we're saying, God, I'm honoring you. Again, husbands, when we love our wives, we're saying, God, I love you, so I love my wife. 
When wives, when you respect your husband, you're saying, God, I respect you, so I'm going to respect my husband. And so us as children in here, none of us were born in a test tube. We're all children. But when we honor our parents, we're saying, God, because I honor you, I'm going to honor my parents. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 12, For the Lord corrects those he loves, just as the father corrects a child in whom he delights. And then... Um, also in Ephesians 6, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So there's things that we see in Scripture that's very clearly outlined that when we bring correction to our children, it's because we love them. You know, sometimes we think like, oh, I don't want to correct my child because it's going to stifle their development, and I just want them to blossom like a tree. You know, I don't want to dictate how their branches expand and grow, Right? So I'm, I'm just going to let my child be a free spirit. And um, again, just look at Sanaya, okay? That would not be loving if I let Sanaya steal people's spam musubis all day long. Because one, it wouldn't be loving for the other people, um, like my, my, uh, my son. Two, it wouldn't be loving for her body. I mean, you can, a, a one-year-old can only eat so much spam musubi for, I mean, even one is pretty unhealthy. Some of you, like, healthy parents are like, you let your one-year-old eat pork byproduct like that? Don't judge me. You don't understand how crazy it is with four kids. <laughs> 7-Eleven, in and out, spouse would be, forget cooking, honey. Here, throw it down in your mouth, quick and easy. <laughs> but, um, you know, when we correct our kids, what's powerful, it's a, it's a picture of the gospel. See, what the gospel message is that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us, right? That's a picture that there's no condemnation in God's kingdom, Condemnation is saying you're not worthy, you've messed up, you're not deserving of forgiveness and love. So instead of running to, you know, your parent or running to God, you should run away from them. And so when I correct my kids, first of all, it says do not provoke your children to anger. And so that's the same goes for me. I, we, me and my wife, we got, we got to get each other's back. So as the head of the home, I'm the one that's doing the disciplining. Even in the middle of the NBA Finals Game 4, I had to pause the TV. Thank God for DVR. <laughs> it's a luxury. I'm, I know, I know. Don't judge me again. But, hey, there's a lot of correction going on in my house. I need to constantly pause. So I pause the TV even when I don't feel like it to not have my wife do something that I'm supposed to do. And so I come in as a picture of Father God bringing correction to his children, to my kids. And so when I correct them, it's not because they broke a rule, but I'm saying it's because they broke trust, that this is something that daddy or mommy has instructed them to do, and when they disobey, it's showing that they're trusting themselves more than they're trusting in what we're telling them. And I, I explain to them that love and trust go hand in hand. And so that changes everything. And, and so even when I correct them, it's not out of like, you, why did you do this? You know, and just yelling at them and screaming at them and belittling them. But it's coming with, with a stern tone, and it's clear that they are being corrected. All right? Bible says, do not spare thy rod. And so I'll leave it at that. It's very clear that they're being corrected. They have no doubt they're being corrected. But I'm doing it out of love. And as I love on them, I hug them immediately. Even if tears are flowing and even if they feel like they, they don't want to, you know, they want to reject my love at that moment, I tell them, Daddy loves you, okay? And Daddy wants to see you become the woman of God God has called you to be. And so I'm helping them see that even when they fail and they disobey, that it doesn't change our love. And so when we correct our children, it's not just so that, you know, they can not embarrass us at wedding parties or at church, you know, or so that we have ruly kids that we can take out to and, uh, you know, have dinner outside of the house sometime. That they're not, like, causing a chaos and riot in the restaurant where HPD needs to be called in and to detain them. <laughs> That's not why we do it. We do it so that they already begin to see a picture of who God is and his love. I mean, the reason why my daughter prayed for my cut toe, Zara, is because I'm demonstrating that to them, God's love. And the reality of my relationship with God through prayer, uh, through reading the word with them. And I'm showing them that this is what it looks like to have a relationship with God. That they too can have that relationship. And so even in correction, they experience that picture. 
And so for that to happen as they see me model prayer uh, together as a family, it's important to have necessary conversations in the right way. Ephesians chapter 4 says, Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint by which it, it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the whole body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now just look at that passage once more and picture your household. How wonderful would it be when every part of a household is functioning the way God designed it to be. Husbands loving wives, wives respecting husbands, children honoring and obeying uh, parents. For that to happen, sometimes we need to have that necessary conversation, conversations with our kids, conversations with our spouses. But it says speaking the truth in love. We are to grow in every way into him who is the head, who is Christ. And so these conversations that we have is not just to bring judgment, it's not just to bring correction, but it's to help. When I talk to my wife about something that's, you know, been on my mind that I see in her, it's not so that she'll be a better wife for my benefit, but it's to help her realize that she's a daughter of God, help her to see God more in her life. And when she corrects me, it's the same thing that's going on that we do with our children. And so we speak the truth in love, allowing each other to grow up into the head who is Christ. See, ultimately, this whole talk tonight about husbands being the head, wives submitting, children honoring parents, really the larger picture is God is over it all. And God adopts us into his family where we learn to live as his children. Ephesians chapter 1, as we close, worship team, you can come on up. You know, I'm just going to have the keys come up. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. So, just in case you're wondering, sons, it also refers to you women, sons and daughters. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved in him. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespass, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. And furthermore, in John chapter 1, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So as we close today, you know, our identity is not found in us being a a better husband, that this is uh, just a relationship talk for me to improve and, and go home and be a more loving husband. Although I pray that does, that does happen. In the same sense, you know, we're not just called to go home. I said we again. <laughs> wives, you wives, um, to go home, I got to respect my husband more. And I hope that happens. But it's the fact that when we are able to walk this out, it's because our identity is not being a husband, a wife, or a child in a home. It's because we are children of God. That God is our ultimate authority. And so here I have an umbrella. And, you know, the, the top portion of the umbrella, the part that shelters us in rain and protects us and covers us, this is the presence of God. This is being under God's authority. But what's interesting here, attached to God's authority is this handle that I need to hold on to. Now some of us, ah, oh, I did it again. So, so I'll just say it. Some of us wives in here, you're, you're holding on to this handle. It's like a husband. He's not worthy of my respect. I, you don't understand the way he talks to me, the way he treats me, Pastor Tim. I don't want to be, I don't want to respect my husband. But by rejecting Respect for your husband and rejecting Ephesians 5, the truth that we looked at tonight, you're rejecting God's covering over your life. And so if you're trying to do it on your own and you're being pelted by the attacks of the enemy and you're wondering why, where, God, is your protection? Where, God, is your provision? Where, God, is your presence and your peace in my life? Well, I want to submit to you is if you're not under his covering, if you're not under his authority, then you're not allowing him to rain down his presence and blessings over your life. You need to get under authority. 
In the same way, husbands, there's no way you can get away with this, is that we're not called to be dictators of our wives. Yes, Ephesians 5 says to, to be able to, um, for our wives to submit to everything to us. But that doesn't mean we harshly tell them to do things just because according to our preferences and what we want and what we need. See, marriage is not about selfishness. Our home is not about selfishness. It's about honoring God. It's about selflessness. And then we cannot forget that as a husband, if you're going to take on that mantle that I am the head of the household and that I am the authority, then we're also taking on that same mantle and saying that I am grabbing on to the fact that Jesus laid down his life the same way I am called to lay down my life for my wife. That the decisions that I make is not just because it's what I see is fitting for myself, but it's me laying down my life, what I believe will allow God to move in my whole family. My vacation preferences, how much I play golf, what I do with my money, it's all in a way I'm laying all that down to die to my wife as Christ died for the church. So as I grab onto this call as the leader of the home, because I want God's presence in my life, I want God's protection, I need to have God as the head of my home. God is the ultimate head of the home. And that's the order. That's what a modern family should look like. It should never change because that t design is timeless. God is timeless. His love is timeless. His covering is timeless. His authority is timeless. And so as we close tonight, I want us all just to stand in response to him. We're not going to sing, but we're just going to bring our place um, of our hearts as the Holy Spirit, I'm sure, may, may have convicted you in certain areas. So let's all stand right now. See, ultimately, it's about loving God and respecting Him. As we do that, we're going to see our relationships change because in our hearts, we're changing. And so we're going to put ourselves in this posture of change by lifting up our hands to God. And I'm going to pray for us. This is a, a, a sign of surrender. And God, we are surrendering our lives to you today. Some of us, we may be in some dire situations in our household. Our relationships are not what, what we know it should be. And so, God, we cry out to you, Lord. May you bring healing into our households right now. May you mend broken marriages. May you mend estranged relationships between parents and children. Because, God, we want to ultimately be able to look at our home and say, yes, this is the way God has designed a family to be. So we can ultimately say, yes, I can say that my family is glorifying you, is a living worship unto you because of the way we love and respect and the way we treat each other. And so for that to happen, it's not about our children starting to obey first or our significant others starting to obey first, but it starts with us. And so God, you know exactly which area in our hearts that we need to surrender to you, we need to turn away from and repent of and turn to you. And so, God, we make this commitment tonight. Help us to honor you with the way we love the members in our families, in our household. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people say, amen, amen. Let's give God some praise tonight.